Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will study Ephesians chapter 4. If you miss any of our studies, you can always go to our website. It is kuim.org. Or you can go to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. All our teachings are posted online. Before we continue, let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for another opportunity for us to gather today to study your word. Father, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will open the eyes of our understanding. You will give us revelation knowledge. You will teach us by your spirit. Dear Holy Spirit, you are the greatest teacher. I am just a vessel. We yield to you today to help us to reveal the truth of the word of God to us today. You know where everybody is tonight, Holy Spirit of God. Minister to them simultaneously. Help us to differentiate between the word of God and human doctrine. Lead us into all the truth. We propose to be doers of the word of God and not just hearers. So we ask you to please help us in this area. Father God, I thank you because by the power of the Holy Ghost, you will help us not to speak any corrupt communication. But that which is used to the edifying, that it will minister grace to the hearer. By the power of the Holy Ghost that he will help us put on the new man, which is created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name we give glory, honor, and praise for everything that you have done and the things that you are yet to do in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Thank you, my good friends. Today, we will study Ephesians chapter 4. Go to our website or our YouTube channels if you missed any of the studies. They are all there. Now, the, let me give you a, a brief summary. The book of um, Ephesians is written by Paul the Apostle. It is one of his prisons letter, along with uh, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, Philemon. The book of Ephesians can be divided into three parts. Wealth, work, as well as uh, warfare. Paul, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, talks about our spiritual wealth, which means the thing that we have right now in Christ Jesus, because we are born again. Our unsearchable riches, things like we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. We are accepted in the beloved. We now have inheritance of God through Christ Jesus. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in all of us. We have boldness and access with confidence by faith through Christ Jesus. And then he tells us that now that we acknowledge these unsearchable riches, he says, go ahead and be a partaker for it belongs to you now. The second part is work. In verses 4 and 5, Paul will talk about uh, Christian work. Now that we have identified the things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, he wants us to put on the new man that is created in righteousness and in true holiness. He wants us now to live out our lives like Christians. To reflect the image of Christ Jesus. 
And in the third part is warfare. In verse 6, he will tell us that the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, Satan and his demons, will try to steal that which belongs to us. Those things that we have identified that we have now in Christ Jesus. He says the enemy is not happy that we got all these things. So he will try to hinder us from being partakers. So he tells us how to stand bold and not give him any place. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very quick summary. But we are going to go ahead and uh, dive into today's teaching. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, I read to you. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, Paul calls himself here a prisoner of our Lord Jesus Christ, even though he's writing his letter from a Roman prison. But he knows and he acknowledges that Jesus Christ is in charge of Rome. So he knows that uh, the one who is the creator of the heaven and the earth is in charge. Regardless of the situation, the circumstances, you find yourself. Always know that um, Jesus Christ is in charge. As we said earlier, as I said earlier, we have already covered chapters 1, 2, and 3. In those chapters, Paul talked about the things that belong to us in Christ Jesus. The unsearchable riches of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that the Father has done through Christ Jesus for us. So now, he wants us, now that we have realized and found out all these unsearchable riches, he wants us now to respond to it. How do we respond? Remember, God did all, all of these things for us through love. And now that we found out what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus, he wants us to respond to it by the way we live. Remember, we are not talking about salvation here. Salvation is not by works. It's not by what you do. Salvation is by grace, through faith. That's how you are saved. You don't do any work to qualify. It's a free gift of God. No man can boast of salvation by what they have done or by what they're doing. But now, after you get born again, you are expected to bear fruit. The fruit of salvation. When you got born again, the Holy Spirit of God who baptized you into the body of Christ moved in you. And now he empowers you to live a good life. A life that will reflect Jesus Christ. A life that will be conformed to his own image. And uh, this life is only possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. Don't depend on your natural ability because it is impossible. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. Why? Because the power of the Holy Ghost now is in you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the Spirit of God will empower you to live this life. Now, he is calling upon us now to live the life that reflects Jesus Christ and who we are in Christ Jesus. He will, he will start by giving us four ways that we can respond to the love which the Father has lavished on us. 
His overwhelming love. Now, it's always in this order. God does something for us, then we respond out of love. He does it first, for we love him because he first loved us. The love of Christ constrains us. So, it's not the other way around. Remember I said that he spent three chapters telling us the things we got in Christ Jesus. The things that God has done for us. So now it becomes our own responsibility to respond after God has done something for us. Anything you do for Christ, anything you do for the kingdom of God, anything that you do for humanity, the purpose of doing that thing should be act of love. Responding to what God has already done for you. Don't do it because um, you are doing God a favor. No, remember that you're only a vessel. There are so many vessels that God can use if you deny yourself to be used. So God does something first. And because of his overwhelming love towards us, we respond by living like Christians, by taking a Christian work in our life. So now he gives us four ways as a beginning, as a start. He gives us Four ways that we can respond, that we can live a Christian life. First one is humility. So humility is to see yourself in the light of the word of God. In the light of what the word of God says about you. No more, no less. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it tells us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Not only that we see ourselves in the light of the word of God, but we see other people in the light of the word of God. Humility is to devour ourselves of selfishness and look at other people as more important. So we let go of self and we put other people first. Jesus Christ is a good example of humility. The Bible tells us that him, being in the form, in form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God. But, he emptied himself of all reputation and became just like one of us and was obedient even unto death. And because of his obedience, God has highly exalted him and has given him a name that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Remember the Bible tells us that if we humble ourselves, we shall be exalted. But God will always resist the proud and he will give grace to the humble. So he talks about humility here. Humility towards the services of God. Humility towards the services to humanity. He wants us to look ourselves in the light of the word of God. The second one he talks about here is gentleness. What is gentleness? Gentleness is the way we respond to when we are attacked. When people offend us, how do we respond to them? Do we respond to them out of love? Or we try to get even? Or we try to revenge? So gentleness is the way you respond. You remember sometimes you hear people make certain statements, sometimes they will say they started, it, they started it first. I didn't start it. They pushed my last button, so I gave it to them. <laughs> if you've heard people talk about it, you know, some of them will say, I don't start troubles, but when you start the trouble, I will give it to you till it overflows. <laughs> and these are Christians making this kind of statement. 
So it tells us to humble us, to, to be gentle. Don't respond when people offend you, when you are cut. He said, don't respond with that uh, uh, mannerism that does not reflect our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not respond back to them in a harsh word or in an action that is not a good representation of a Christian. The third one he talks about here is long-suffering. Long-suffering means to be patient. And uh, it means to have endurance when endurance towards aggravating people. When you are bugged, to have endurance all the way from beginning to the end. Now, if you have children or if you are married or if you have close associates at work, you will understand that uh, you don't expect somebody to do something once. If you are thinking they will do it only once, you are mistaken somewhere. You, you, you find out that they do something over and over and over again. So, in patience, you say, have endurance. Give them tolerance. Don't write them off and say, that's it. I'm not talking to that one anymore. I'm done with him. That is what he called patience. The fourth one he talks about here is bearing with one another in the love of Christ. Love. Jesus Christ says, new commandment I give to you. That you love one another even as I have loved you. Now, remember that everything I'm saying you here right now, this new life cannot be achieved on your own natural ability. You got to depend on the Holy Ghost for this to happen. When it comes to love, the love of Christ is already shared in our hearts. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 5. By the Holy Ghost. So you acknowledge that the love is already in you. And then you depend on the Holy Ghost to love. Not only those people who love you, but those your enemies, the ones that won't agree with you, the ones that will always walk their ways to attack you. Because Jesus Christ tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. So it is a commandment of love. And we continue. Now, in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So now he begins to tell us how to walk together as one body, different members in one body. That's what he's going to let us in right now. How we work together, even though we are different parts of the body, but we belong to one body as a whole. So he tells us now how to work together. He gives us seven truths. I just mentioned them now. Seven truths that unite us in one body. When I speak about body, I mean the body of, a, a body of Christ. So seven truths. If you say that you are a Christian, that you are a child of God, that you are born again, he says these are seven truths that will unite you. That will get you associated with other people. These are the essentials. These are the basics that you got to believe. If you are a child of God, if you say that you are a Christian. And we will go through every one of them. 
Number one here, he says, there is one body. So, it's talking about the one body of Christ. We are one body. Regardless of our denomination. Now, remember, there is nothing wrong with denomination. The problem is when people get denominational. When they practice narrow sectarianism. When they focus on non-essentials instead of the essentials. The things that divide the body of Christ. When he, talk, when he talks about unity, unity is different from uniformism. In uniformism, everybody is one. Which means there is only one church. So everybody must be on that one name, one church. In uniformism, we must have one uh, uh, method of doing things. That's not what he's talking about when he talks about unity. When he talks about unity, he's referring to us that even though we come from different backgrounds, so many people from different backgrounds, he tells us there, is, there are seven truths that are supposed to bind us together as one body. We don't have to all agree in one method of doing something like in baptism. Some agree that it's going to be done through sprinkling of water. Some say you've got to immerse the person into the water. And communion. Some will have different ideas and say you've got to take communion every week. Some say once a month. Some say uh, 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 it doesn't matter when you do it. So even though we have different uh, opinions, different ways and methods of doing things, we are supposed to be one based on these things that I'm saying. Regardless of your own opinion, you got to believe in these seven truths. Otherwise, you are not a Christian, my friend. You are not a Christian. The second one is one spirit. So he tells us that it's only one Holy Spirit of God. And this one Holy Spirit of God is the one that gives us the gifts of the spirit if you involve yourself into occultism and the spiritism think about it again these are the ways people pursue demonic activities there is only one spirit of god not this my friends not every miracle that is done inside the church is of the Holy Ghost. There are some of them that are under the umbrella of uh, demonic activities. So, it tells us here that uh, there is only one Holy Spirit of God. The third one it says here is one hope. So, what is the hope he's talking about here? Christians should have one hope. The Bible tells us what the hope is. The hope is the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are waiting for. And this glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ will start with the rapture of the church and the transformation of these uh, mortal bodies into immortality. The Bible says that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And he says, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. And we who are alive and still remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And so shall we be with the God, with the Father, with Jesus Christ forever. Bible tells us that this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortality will put on immortality, this mortal body. So the hope of the church is the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're waiting for. But remember that you cannot get to this extent if you don't believe in resurrection. 
It's quite unfortunate that are some people, they call themselves Christians, but they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how are you going to get to this level of expecting him to come back again? So the hope of the church is the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the transformation of these bodies. Remember, you are not yet redeemed completely. You have been purchased. But we are still waiting for the full redemption of the body. And then the hope of the church proceeds to the millennium. When Jesus Christ is going to rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And the eternal kingdom that will be established after that. This is the hope of the church. One Lord... One Lord is talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Remember that the word Lord is not his name. His name is not Lord. His name is Jesus. Lord is his, his title. The word in Greek is uh, kurios. It means the one who has the ownership. The one who is supreme. The one who governs. That's what it means. So when we say Lord, it is a relational term. He is my Lord. The one who has the ownership of me. And I am his own bond servant, which is doulos. The Greek word is doulos. A bond servant by choice. One who has given up his rights and his privileges to serve a master. Jesus Christ says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? So we have only one Lord. So we ought to do the things that the one Lord said, Jesus Christ. If we deviate from what he says, means that we have another Lord. One faith. As Christians, we have one faith. The faith that we have in God. We don't have faith in other things, in the things that perish, the things that will pass away in the twinkle of an eye. Our faith is in God and the promises of the Father. One faith, one baptism. So baptism is talking about here, the Bible talks about other types of baptisms, like water baptism, the baptism of repentance, which John the Baptist did, Jesus Christ talked about the baptism of his suffering. And there is another baptism, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But the one he's talking about here is the baptism of salvation. By one spirit are we baptized into one body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. So that baptism means uh, baptizo, the Greek word is baptizo, which means to so immerse. So we are immersed into the body of Christ by the one spirit of God. That's the baptism he's talking about here. One God and Father. Remember we have only one Father, one God. Pay attention when people talk about God. Because there are so many things, I will use the term things, that people refer to as God. But when you mention God, try to differentiate it from those things that people call God. The creator of the heaven and earth, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then they will understand that you are talking about God, who is the only God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. In verse 7 it says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So it's going to talk about spiritual gifts now. That's what we are getting into right now. He says to each one of us, pay attention. He says each one of us, which means there is no exception. As we proceed, he's going to give us examples 
of some of the gifts. But they are not limited on, only to those ministry gifts. Each one of us has a gift from God. That grace he's talking about here is the power to do something which he has called you to do. In any, regardless of your background or your occupation or the thing that you do for a living, that is one thing that God has called you to do. It doesn't matter if you are a bricklayer, a carpenter, or if you are a bank manager or a janitor, or if you are a businessman or a woman. Even in that place, God has a calling for you in that place. What you got to do is to find out what God has called you to do. Many times people will ask you, how do I know what God has called me to do? How do I find out? Remember, we are talking about gifts here. Gifts we are talking about here is different from talent. Now, talent is what you are born with. You may be talented to play the piano, to sing, or to do mechanical works. That may be where you, got, where you are talented. But when we talk about gifts here, we're talking about giving by the Holy Spirit of God, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God in an area that he has called you into. So if you don't know what you are called to do, ask the one that gives the gift, the Holy Ghost. Ask him. He is a person. He lives in you. He hears you when you ask. And he will give you a response. He will answer you. He will tell you. He will lead you into all the truths. He will show you those things that are yet to come. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you right now. So you start by asking him, Dear Spirit of God, please show me what God has called me to do. Because in any area where you specialize, you can advance the kingdom of God in that place. You can. You can. You can bring people into the kingdom of God. You can. Because the empowerment is there. Who he calls, he will always empower to be successful in that thing which he's called him to do. It is not by might. It is not going to be by power, but it's going to be, it's not going to be by strength, but it's going to be by the power of the Holy Ghost. That you will be able to achieve this thing that he has called you to do. So you ask the Holy Spirit to show you, tell you what he has God called you to do. And now another tip is this. In that thing, you will always have uh, uh, boldness. You will be very, very happy doing that thing. Where other people around you are struggling doing that same thing, you are very successful. Not that there will not be challenges, but you will always overcome them. It will not be a struggle for you. And while you are, you've asked the Holy Spirit to show you, remember that God will show you things one step at a time. He will not paint the whole picture for you and say, here it is, A to Z, go, fulfill. No. He wants you to have faith. So he shows you one thing at a time. So I don't want you to despise the day of small beginning. Have patience. Believe in God after you've asked your Holy Spirit and he will unfold this revelation to you step by step as you continue to be patient and willing to receive the revelation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he talks about these gifts now. He says to everyone, each one, not only to the pastor, not only to the evangelist, to every one of us. Regardless of what you do, there is a calling for you. Find out what that calling is. And then the grace of God, the empowerment of God will be there for you to help you advance the kingdom of God, to fulfill the plan and the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ for your life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in verse 8. Therefore, he says, 
when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. So now, he, you can notice here that he's giving you a quotation. So he's quoting from somewhere. He's quoting from Psalm 68, a psalm of victory. When David conquered the Jebusites, which is the modern day Jerusalem, so it's a psalm of victory. So in a minute here, he's going to tell you about the victory which Jesus Christ ha has over principalities and powers. The Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers and made a public show of them. So he tells us here that the same Jesus Christ who ascended into heaven is the same Jesus Christ who first descended. What is he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he says, and the world took flesh and dwelt among us. He came from above into the world. And after his death and resurrection, he descended on the, he, he descended in, in, into hell. Some people will call it Hades. So remember that in Hades, before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, was divided into two compartments. There is one compartment where people were tormented and another the, a compartment where people were comforted at the bosom of Abraham. So Jesus Christ descended into the pit, the Hades. And when he went over there, he preached the gospel to them. Those people who were comforted by Abraham. He said, hey, Good news. The Messiah is here. I have come. The Tala style. All is finished. The work is done. I'm going to take you now with me into heaven. And remember that the people who were there, they were there in faith. They were people who died in faith, waiting for the Messiah to come. They couldn't have gone into heaven before the Messiah was uh, 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 raised from the dead. So Jesus said, good news, I have come. I'm going to take you along with me. And the Bible tells us that in Jerusalem, people we have seen walking on the street, dead people. Somebody looks and says, oh, that's David. Whoa, what's going on here? That is David. Oh, that's Moses. Oh, that is Abraham over there. Whoa, whoa. They were walking on the street. Because <coughs> Jesus took captivity captive. And he took them up to the Father in heaven. This is what he's talking about here. And in verse 11, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now he's talking about this... Um, we we'll call them a ministry, some call them ministry gifts. And he gives us these offices here. First of all, he talks about apostles. Who is an apostle? An apostle is someone who is sent and empowered to go and do the work of Christ. We had originally 12 apostles, but after that, we had all the apostles. And even today, we still have apostles. Barnabas was called an apostle, Timothy an apostle. They were not in the original 12. Paul an apostle. He was not in the original 12. So we still have apostles today. The second one here, prophets. Who is a prophet? Now, remember that the Old Testament prophet does not have the same status with the New Testament prophet. What is the difference? The Old Testament prophets, we call them, 
we are called seers. They inquired of God for the people. So people will come to them to make inquiries. In Old Testament, the Spirit of God rested upon the prophets, kings, priests, and people's few other people who were called for special uh, 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 assignment for God. The Spirit of God was not in everybody. So if you want to know the mind of God, if you want to make an inquiry, you got to go to a prophet. But now in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit of God lives in every believer. So we don't have to go around now looking for prophets and say, prophesy, tell me, inquire of God for me. No, we don't because the Spirit of God dwells in us now. So the Old Testament prophet, not only that he foretold, but he also has that um, a, a, a spirit of foretelling. And I'm going to tell you the difference. The Old Testament prophet would always inquire of God for the people. They would receive messages from God. Warning for the people. They would tell the people the mind of God. And that is a foretelling. The seeing to the future, they were called the seers. And not only that, they will exalt the people, they will encourage them, which is foretelling. Now, for you to stand in the office of a prophet in the New Testament, you will have to be operating in two of the three revelation gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I will tell you those three. A word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, and spiritual discernment. So two of these three revelation gifts will have to operate in your life on a regular basis. As well as foretelling. Remember the Bible tells us that anyone, any Christian can prophesy. It's Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, I would that you all prophesy. And then he tells you, he that prophesies, prophesies unto the church, unto edification, exhortation, and comforting. So the purpose of prophecy is to exalt, edify, and comfort the people of God. So because you do this, doesn't make you a prophet, doesn't put you in the office of a prophet. Now, pastors and teachers, there are people who see this as one and the same. Pastors here means shepherds, not uh, preachers. Remember, a preacher is someone who proclaims Jesus Christ to the unconverted. So you see them on the side streets. They proclaim Jesus Christ. The good news has come. Jesus Christ died for your sins. God raised him from the dead. Now he has a new life to anyone who believes. Receive him today and you will have that too, new nature. So they proclaim about Jesus Christ. But a pastor ought to be a teacher. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd will feed the sheep. To feed the sheep with the word of God. So that's what it's supposed to be. A shepherd is supposed to be that pastor who will teach the people of God the word of God. Not the one that proclaims. And the people he is proclaiming to are spiritual babies. They've not been fed with the word of God. That's not what a pastor is supposed to be. Now he's going to tell us what is the reason for this ministry gifts. He's going to tell us what the reason is.
Pay attention. It's very important that you don't miss this part. In chapter 12, it says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickling of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells us here the purpose of these offices. Why has God chosen these men and women into these offices? He says the main purpose is to teach the congregation to equip them so that the same congregation will go out and become ministers. Now the word minister means a servant. It's not a title. There are people who brag themselves with that title, minister, minister, this, minister, that. It simply means a servant. And we are called, the congregation, the people of God are called to be ministers. So the purpose of these offices, the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, I think I miss evangelist. So I don't think I, I talked about it. An evangelist is one who goes and uh, and 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 uh, bring people into the kingdom of God. So the evangelists, most of the time, they don't have any church of their own. So they are not pastoring a church. But they will go from one place to another, uh, having like crusades to uh, uh, bring people, souls, into the kingdom of God. And whoever they win for Christ will become church members. The pastor will then take over to pastor and feed this new convert with the word of God. So that's what I was saying. So I, I was say, what I was saying is uh, the purpose is that this the congregation will become the ministers. They will go out there after they have been fed with the word of God. They will be able to go out and minister to other people through the way they live, their conduct, their mannerism. And to the words that come out of their mouth. People will look at them and say, that is a difference in you. What is it all about? And they will bring souls into the kingdom of God. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Instead of calling the pastor and say, pastor, come pray, come pray, come pray. They will cast out demons. Instead of calling, pastor, come, come, come. So the pastor, the teachers will teach the congregation so that the congregation will be equipped to be able to do the work of the ministry. They will feed the congregation with the word of God so that the congregation will be able to grow and don't remain spiritual babies so that they will be able to fish out false teaching. They will be able to identify these false prophets in the church. He tells you here to a perfect man. He wants the congregation to grow to that status. The word perfect here is a teleos. That's a Greek word. It means to grow, to mature, as a boy will grow into a man. So they don't remain spiritual babies. But every day they are fed with the word of God. And they grow, and they grow some more, and they grow some more, and they grow some more. So that they are not tossed around with every wind of doctrine. They will hear something and they will say, no, that's not what the word of God says. We're not going to do that. It's not a, there is no, nothing like that in the scriptures. So these are the people he's talking about here. He said, this office is that... God, Jesus Christ has given to the church is for this purpose, to bring out, the, to, to help the congregation grow and mature in their Christian work. The question is this. Now, the question is this. Who are we choosing? What is the modus operandi when we choose our pastors, shepherds, those who are supposed to be the shepherds. What is the modus operandi? 
Are we looking at resumes? Looking for people who have that special um, quality or rhetorical quality. So they can speak very good and they will attract people. Those who have the record of uh, making a congregation grow. Are we looking for people who will sit on a pedal stool and they want to be served? Are we looking for people who are good entertainers? The congregation is growing, but it's filled up with spiritual babies. Are we looking for higher lengths? People who get paid. And whenever you have a higher lengths, they don't care for the sheep. Because they are, up, they, they are in there for what they can get out of it. Or are we looking for shepherds? Those who will feed the people of God with the word of God. Not with human doctrines and calisthenics. Things that are not of God. The dogmas that have arisen from people. Are we looking for shepherds? Who will feed the people with the word of God? Peter says, desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby. There is no other way a Christian can grow apart from the word of God. And if you have a pastor who doesn't understand the word of God, who is not called in the first place? Because if they are not called, it's only going to be a struggle. They'll become a higher lane. We don't have any business laying hands on people. We should only ratify those God has already called. And we give them the approval and say, go ahead and pastor this church. These are the things we should be looking out for. Before we choose our pastors. Very important. Why am I saying this? Because souls are at stake. People's in eternal status are at stake. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 5. God says, I will give you pastors according to my own heart. And they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is, what, this is the plan of God. He says, pastors, shepherds, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding of the word of God. That's how important it is. Can we be very bold, ministers, pastors, I'm talking to you right now. Evangelists, I'm talking to you right now. Can we be very, very bold and speak just like Paul spoke? Necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I do not teach the gospel. If I do not preach the gospel. He says, I am compelled to preach the gospel. And what gospel did Paul preach? Not human tradition or philosophy or psychology or concept. No. It was a doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he was persecuted. Can we be able to be accused just like the apostles were accused, disciples were accused in Jerusalem when the elders, the chief priests, and the rulers accused them for of filling the whole Jerusalem with the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not um, a humanistic uh, 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 psychology. No. So it's very important. When we select pastors, when we choose our pastors, it is our own duty, the congregation, to make sure that the one that they are selecting is first of all called of God. And secondly, one who is able to feed the people of God with the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. We are now in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. 
according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It tells us here, instead of being tossed to and fro by every wind of the doctrine, it wants us to grow in love in Christ Jesus, looking at Jesus Christ as our own example. And by doing so, we will be able to build one strong body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17, it says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work of all uncleanliness with uh, greediness. He says, now that you have discovered what you have in Christ Jesus, now that you have discovered the things that God has wrought in you through Christ Jesus, he says, respond now by the way you live. He says, do not live any longer like the way you used to live when you were not born again. He says, don't be like the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles that he's talking about here are the hidden. The hidden. So, he tells you now about the old life which you had before you came to Christ. The same life that the hidden are living right now in the world. This life has nothing to do with Christ. This says they are alienated from God completely. They are dead. Their spirits are separated from the spirit of God. That's what is called spiritual death. Spiritual death. So they are spiritually dead. And you know the Bible tells us how to pray for these ones because we can actually pray for them. We don't pray for we don't pray to God to save them because salvation is already available. And God cannot go against their choices because he created them as free mortal agents. So how do we pray for these ones? We pray that God will grant them repentance so the acknowledging of the truth. Perhaps they will recover themselves from the snail of the evil one who is holding them in captivity against their will. Bible tells us that whom the God of this world has blinded the eyes, the mind. Their mind. So now, you pray that they will be delivered from this bondage from this blindness, from the yoke of the enemy, <coughs> from the power of Satan. You can take authority in the name of Jesus and break the power of Satan over their lives. Because right now they are completely dead. It's just like you talking to a blind person and say, can you see that beautiful sunset? They cannot. Or to a deaf person, can you hear that beautiful melody? They cannot. They don't have the ability. These ones are being held in captivity against their will. Satan is the one holding them. So you pray for God to give them repentance so that they will come to their awareness. They will, they will become aware that they are going in the wrong path. When you break the power of Satan over their lives, it means that now they are able to make a choice. They are able to Choose. Able to choose Jesus Christ and make him the Lord and their Savior. So he talks about this way you live before you got born again. And he tells you, no, don't go back to that life anymore. 
Don't. Now he's going to tell you the life that he wants you to live. In verse 28, he says, But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, <clears throat> as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, that old life is not what you were taught about Jesus Christ. He says there is a new life now which should reflect Jesus Christ. That we are now called to be conformed into his own image by the way we live, by the way we speak, how we conduct our lives. And remember that this life that he's talking about here, the new man is talking about here, is not possible without the power of the Holy Ghost. You can never fulfill this new man that is calling you to put on now by your own ability. It's only possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. So if you are looking at yourself and you say, hmm, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. Think again. You don't measure up because you are depending on yourself. But the moment you yield to Holy Spirit, to the prompting of the Spirit of God, to the power of the Holy Ghost, you will know that he will empower you to live this life that, he, that you've been called to live. He tells you to pull off the old man. Now, what is the old man? <laughs> Someone said, I know what happens to Paul's dad. And then the other person says, what happened to him? And he says, he was crucified with Jesus. Because Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> so now he, he thought that the Paul's dad was crucified with Jesus Christ. But that's not what he's talking about. Now your old man is talking about here is your old mannerism, your conduct, the thing that you did before you got born again. And now he, say, he tells you to put on the new man. Now, the putting on of the new man is a thing of uh, choice. Remember, it is a thing of choice. Before you got born again, you did not have the ability. No, it was not in you. But after you got born again and the Spirit of God now lives in you, He empowers you. So, to sin or to miss the mark becomes a thing of choice. You really want to do it. Not like you didn't have the ability not to. But you, you, you went ahead and you did it. Remember the Bible tells us in um, uh, uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 16, I believe. He says, know you not that to whom you yield yourself, servants to obey. His servants you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedient unto righteousness. So it tells you here it is a choice. You choose to obey Satan and his uh, demands, or you choose to put on the new man, which you have now the ability to put on. Like I said, it's empowerment of the Holy Ghost. It's not because it's, you're not going to do it on your own ability. The Bible tells us that all things that pertain to life and godliness has been given to us through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. So all things, they've been given unto us. We have now the ability. Christ is in you now. It is that hope of glory. It is that hope of empowerment by the Holy Ghost. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. You, you can no longer be a slave unto sin. 
for you've been crucified with Christ. The life you live now should be a life that reflects Jesus Christ. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you are no longer under the law. If we, through the Spirit of God, do modify the deeds of the flesh, we will live this life we are talking about. It is a life that you got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. So don't worry if you don't measure up. What you got to do now is recognize there is one greater in you. The Holy Spirit, he is there to help you, the comforter, the advocate, the helper, the one that takes hold together with you against the forces of darkness. He is right there with you. You got to yield to him, recognize him, fellowship with him, and you will see yourself now begin to excel and live this life that you have been called to live. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in we are verse 20. Actually, we are in verse 25. We're making progress, friends. <laughs> Good progress. We are in verse 25. It says, Therefore, putting away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He continues to tell you the way to live now that you have put on the new man. He tells you now, put away lies. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Do not change your stories. The way you deal with people. Be very, very straightforward. If you can't do it, say, I can't do it. If you are wrong, say, I am sorry, I did it, but I was wrong. Put away lies. When you are dealing with one another. In verse 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, he's talking about our anger. There is a righteous anger. There is an anger that is not sin. Anger against, against unrighteousness. Anger against sin. There's nothing wrong with it. Jesus Christ cleans the temple at the beginning of his ministry and also towards the end of his ministry. He was angry at the people. So there is an anger against unrighteousness. And this kind of anger is acceptable in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. On your wrath. So what is he talking about here is simple, settle your disputes as soon as possible. Your misunderstanding with one another. Don't let it linger. Settle them as soon as possible. It is what God expects you to do. Don't go about and bragging and say, I am right. He is wrong. I am right. And you frown your face with that straight face. I am right. He is wrong. No, <laughs> that's not what the way to go. He says, come together. Let go. Bring those disputes, those quarrels. Bring them to a trash. Settle them as soon as possible. Regardless of who is wrong. And when, there is, when you cannot settle it with that person, bring it to the Lord. Bring it to God. Pour out your heart. Tell him the way it is. But don't let it linger. That is the thing he's telling us here. And verse 
And it says, no give place to the devil. So, it says, don't give any place to the devil. He cannot tell you not to give a place to the devil if you don't have the ability to do it. And because you do have the ability, he tells you here, don't give you any place. Remember Jesus Christ gave us the power and authority over Satan and his demons in his name. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils, which is demons, because there is only one devil. We have now authority in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have now authority over him. In the name of Jesus. Remember, in the name of Jesus, not in your own name. So give him no place. As soon as you identify his work around your family, around your business, around your job, around your, the things that pertains to you. You got to take authority and tell him to get out in the name of Jesus. And he will. He is a tenacious rascal. A sorry, a sorry cost. He will try to come back again. But don't give him no place. That's what he's telling us here. Exercise the authority that you have now in the name of Jesus. Don't pray to God. God, please make Satan go away. He's all up in my business. No, you've been wasting your time praying that kind of prayer. Take authority. Put him where he belongs. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the authority now belongs to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 28 it says, Let him who stole steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Something to give him who has need. Let him that stole steal no more. Sometimes we will ex excuse ourselves from this um, verse. And we will say, I don't have a gun. I have not robbed anybody before. I have not stolen anything from anybody before. But think about other ways that we could be doing this unknowingly. In your place of work, the place where you work, do you punch in, do you clock in, and then you goof around? And then you go and take a bathroom uh, a breath. You go in, into the toilet and you stay there as long as you want, chatting on your phone. <laughs> if I am stepping on your feet right now, just give me a minute. But it's very important that we recognize these things. When you clock in, do you stay in that place that you are supposed to be? Or do you clock in and you leave and you ask other people to cover you? Do you go home sometimes with some of the supplies and you say only a few uh, printing papers is not going to uh, uh, bring this company down, is a, is a rich company? Do you go to work and you print all your stuff at work without the permission to do so? Are you enrolled in some of uh, enrolled in some of uh, government benefits that you know that you don't qualify? But we change figures and then we participate in them. We withdraw benefits from those programs 
even though we don't qualify. When we file our taxes, do we change numbers to pay less or we avoid paying anything at all? So these are the things we ask ourselves and we say, how are we doing in this area? Help me, Holy Spirit. Point them out to me. They may not be obvious to me. I may not be aware that I'm doing these things, but help me. I want to be a good example. I want to live that life which Jesus Christ expects me to live. So what are we doing? He says, instead of doing that, look at other people as more important as you are. Because we're doing all these things because of selfish reasons. But he says, look at other people. He says, let the reason why you're going to work be not only for you, for you, for you, but also to help those who are in need. And remember that uh, helping people who are in need is a spiritual law that comes with a blessing. Yeah, the Bible tells us, give and they shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shaking together, rolling over shall men give unto your bosom. Bible tells us that he that lends to the poor, he that gives to the poor, lends to the Lord. And he will repay him. In Proverbs, the Bible tells us, there is, there is it that uh, scatters. And yet increases. And that is it. That withholds more than its meat. But it leads to poverty. It's a spiritual law. The more you give. The more you receive. The more you are blessed. Be on the blessed side. More blessed to give. Than to receive. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are making progress. We are now in um, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessarily edification? That it may impart grace to the hearers. It tells you now the power of your mouth. The power of your tongue. How you should use your tongue as a Christian. Remember we are still talking about putting on the new man. And this is a part of it. Now he talks about your words. Even so the tongue is a small member of the body. But in James he tells us that it boasts of great things. You see, he says, see how great a forest, a little fire kindles. There are people who have committed suicide, kill themselves because of what was said to them. A verbal abuse. People have lost their careers, ruined completely. Because of what they said. They thought the microphone was turned off. But they did not know that it was still on. So they said it. <laughs> they said it. And everybody heard it. And now they are forced to resign or they are fired. Marriages have been dissolved. Because of what the spouse says to one another. Because of one, what one spouse says to another. People have been shot to death. Killed. Because of verbal argument. The things that come out of our mouth. James says with the tongue. We bless the Father. And with the same mouth, we curse men who are created in the similitude of God, who are created in the image of God. He says, These things ought not to be so. Can a fresh water 
and the bitter water come out from the same fountain, it's not supposed to be so. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his mouth, his tongue from evil, and his lips that he speaks no God. Two things he's, tell, he, 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 he's telling us here. He says, if you want to see good days, which means if you want to be prosperous, and if you want to have a long life, longevity, he says that you got to keep your mouth where it's supposed to be. Put a guide over my tongue, my mouth. You got to put a guide over your mouth. For you to succeed in these two areas. Death and the life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21. We are snared by the words of our mouth. Proverbs 6 2. Where do you stand with your mouth? What are you saying with your mouth? There are some times that uh, we should stay away from a conversation. You know that telephone call that is coming in, that if you answer that phone call, you know what the conversation is going to be all about. You know that the person calling will be calling to talk about somebody. So why do you answer the phone? There are some places that you should avoid visiting. Because, you know, when you show up there or when they come to you, it's, not gonna be, it's just going to be conversation. that are not sound and pure. So we stay away from these places. Now I'm going to tell you how to keep your mouth from... Corrupt communication. It is found in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence. We live in a world. Every day we are bombarded through social media, through television, through uh, radio. We see all kind of images. They bring them to us right in, inside our bedroom on the television. You hear all kind of words, obscenities, profanities. You see all kind of pictures, pornography. This is the world that we live in today. But it says, guard your heart with all diligence. Which means he wants you to put a bouncer in your heart. So that these things will not come in from your mind and get into your heart. Because the mind is the doorway to your heart. You gotta be very conscious of the things you listen to and the things that you watch. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. If you let these things come in and you let them come in, it's just only a matter of time, they will come out. It will come out. So you put a bouncer there Using a certain criteria, which I'm going to tell you now in a minute. So that not everything is let in there. The criteria that I want you to use is found in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are loving, whatsoever things are of good report, if that be any virtue, 
if that be any praise, he says, think on these things. So when those things are coming, bombarding your mind, you're going to be there looking at them. Is this worth of praise? Is this any virtue in this one here? Is this any truth in this one here? And you use this as a criteria. If there is none, if he doesn't meet the criteria, if he doesn't qualify, you say, bounce, door close. <laughs> you kick him out. So that they don't go in there and then you speak them out. Now, do not judge. Because when we talk, most of the time we talk about people, we are judging them. And the reason why we should not judge, because the Bible says, judge so that you will not be judged. Sorry, judge not so that you will not be judged. The reason why we don't judge is this. Whenever you judge somebody, you put yourself in a spot, very miserable spot around them. You will not be able to be yourself around them for the simple reason, because you know that they are looking for any opportunity to judge you back. So you live around them on, in a very uncomfortable manner. Another reason why you should not judge is you don't know the details surrounding the the thing that happened. You don't know the details. You don't see the condition of their heart. Maybe something they did wrong and they repented in, and, they, and they asked God for forgiveness. And now God has already forgiven them, but you are judging them. So that is the reason why we should not judge. We should always do unto others. As we will have them do unto us, Jesus says. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, glamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So many times people will ask me, what does it mean, do not grieve the Holy Spirit? And before, before I tell you that, this is a scripture. If somebody is doubting or trying to ask you, is Holy Spirit a person? Because there are some who don't believe he's a person. They think he's a force. Tell them to this scripture right here. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And you ask them, when was the last time that you grieved the force? And they will, they will answer the question by themselves. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to tell you the things that qualify because to grieve the Holy Spirit who is in you. Remember, the day you got born again, the Holy Spirit took his abode in you. Now he dwells in your heart. Your body became his temple. Anything that is a, the, anything that represents your old nature, your old man, will grieve the Holy Spirit. Remember, he sees your heart. You will grieve the Holy Spirit by your thoughts, by your words, by your actions. There are things you do people don't see because we call them spiritual sin. They originate from your heart, even though you don't speak them out, but they are in you. So the things that grip the Holy Spirit are not the only thing that are listed here, but he sees your heart. Anything that you are doing that does not represent Christ, that does not conform to the image of Christ, will grieve the Holy Ghost. It is a thing of the heart. He sees your heart. He knows the condition of your heart. You can try to fake it. You can try to act like everything is okay when you are speaking to people. Because they can't see the condition of your heart. But the Holy Spirit sees right in. He sees everything. 
So he tells you the things here that would grieve him. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice, contention, covetousness. These things will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And you want Christ to dwell in your heart. Remember last uh, 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 a week we covered let Christ dwell, let, let Christ dwell in your heart. Quit means let him settle in your heart. Let him be comfortable there. So the things that will displace Christ will grieve the Holy Ghost. That's what it is. And in verse 32, it says, and be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave us. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about forgiveness now. We've got to forgive even as Christ forgave us. Even God in Christ forgave us. How much did God forgive us? To what extent? Remember in the Old Testament, they have to do sacrifices year after year on Yom Kippur. The uh, high priest will go into the Holy of Holies every year just to cover their sins, just to cover them and cover them. They were not forgiven. They were just covered. But Jesus Christ made one sacrifice, an eternal sacrifice. And then we are forgiven forever. That's what he's saying here. So now he's telling us to do the same thing. To forgive one another. Peter asked Jesus Christ. How often, how many times should I forgive my brother if he's sinned against me? Seven times? He thought he was being, you know, very, very liberal, you know. But Jesus answered and said, 70 times seven, 490 times in a day. The summary of what Jesus Christ said here is, forgiveness is a way of life, is a lifestyle. Because he knows that when Peter will come to 490, he will lose count before he gets to 490. So forgiveness is a thing of the heart, is a lifestyle. Medical science tells us that there are so many diseases related to unforgiveness, to stress. When you don't forgive, your body begins to build up chemicals. And these chemicals will lead to different types of diseases. Now, the person that you are mad at, Maybe they're at home having a very sound sleep. Some of them even snoring deep in their sleep. But you are somewhere mad at them, stressed out at them. Some of them, they have even come to you and say, I am sorry. But you boldly say, I will never forgive them for what they did. For what they did, I will never forgive them. You are holding it for against them, not willing to forgive. When we don't forgive, put us in a prison, a prison that we have built ourselves. So we become prisoners of our own prison. Are you hearing me, friends? Someone says, how soon should I forgive? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Because you don't want to remain a prison of your own prison for a long time. Do I have to wait until they ask for forgiveness? No. How soon do you want to be free is the question. <laughs> How soon do you want to get out of this prison? <laughs> as soon as possible. Even though they don't ask for forgiveness. Remember Jesus tells us that if we don't forgive, our Heavenly Father is not going to forgive us. 
I didn't say that Jesus said that. And that is true. But let me give you an advice. When you forgive people because of the wrong they did, Do not give them an opportunity again for them to repeat the same thing. Let me give you an example. If someone stole from you, even though you forgive them, but don't put yourself again in the place of trusting them. Don't give them an opportunity again to steal from you. That will not be wisdom on your side. So as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus, we gotta let ourselves free from having a because from being a prisoner of our own prison and forgive one another. How do you know that you have forgiven somebody? A very good question. I'm glad you asked. When you can comfortably kneel down. And pray for those people, asking God to bless them, asking God to show them kindness, asking God to help them out. This is when you have arrived. If you can do that, means that genuinely you have forgiven them from the depth of your heart. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice, wherever you are, and you have not met Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. Now is an opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ today as your Lord and your Savior. To be born again means that you let go your self-righteousness. And now you depend on Jesus Christ for what he did at the cross. 100%. You ask him to forgive your sins. You believe that he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead. And then you ask him now to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. And that's not enough because you need to have a relationship with him. So you begin a, a new relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. Unfortunately, there are so many people in the church, Christians who are not yet born again. You could be a member of a church. You could be baptized in water, but you are not a Christian. It is possible. And we have so many people in this condition. Jesus Christ, talking to Nicodemus, says, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You cannot go around. There are no other ways that you got to go. Strength is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to heaven. It's not broad. There are not too many ways. There is only one name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus. If you belong to other religions, and you are thinking that all roads lead to Christ, you are making a big mistake because the Bible tells me that you cannot have the Father God without Jesus Christ. All roads may lead to other God, but not to the Father, the creator of the heaven and earth. So you must come through Jesus Christ to get to the Father. The day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Jesus Christ is standing at the door. He's knocking. He's knocking. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and him with me. Which means it's a decision you got to make for yourself because we are free mortal agents. God created us to make choices. So you got to choose. Do you want Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Or do you, do you want to reject him?
Pilate, during the trial of Jesus Christ, he asked the Jews, what shall I do with Jesus Christ, who is called the Christ? The same question is presented before you today. You will be the one making that judgment now. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Are you going to receive him today and have eternal life? Or are you going to reject him like the Jews did? It's all up to you to make that call. Remember the time is very short. Whatever you got to do, you got to do it quickly and you got to do it while you are still alive. When your spirit leaves your body, it becomes too late. Just only today, about 155,000 people died in the world. Where did they go? Some of them did not make preparation for eternal life. They spend their life only here preparing for these things that perish. The things that will be dissolved. But they did not make arrangements where they're going to spend eternity. If they rejected Jesus when they were alive, they will go to hell. Because hell is a real place where those who reject Jesus will spend eternity. What arrangement have you made for eternity? Are you willing to spend eternity in heaven? If you are willing to do that, there is only one way. It got to be through Jesus. Not through the way you live. Not because of your good works. Not because of the things you are doing right. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the presence of God. For all have sinned and come short of glory. There is none righteous. But thanks be to God who has given us a new life through Christ Jesus and made it possible that we can now be new creatures that will have eternal life only through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer with me, you will now have eternal life. If you die, you will go to heaven spending eternity with God. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that he is your son, that he died for my sins. And God, you raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I'm now born again. My sins are forgiven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Father God, I give you all the glory for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, congratulations. Welcome into the kingdom of God. Now, there is a subsequent experience called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Some people call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is evident by speaking with other tongues. If you go to my YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian, there is a teaching there called Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will help you and guide you and enlighten you in this experience. Remember that you are now a baby Christian. So you need to grow in your faith. And you can only do that through the word of God. So buy a Bible, put your nose in the word of God. Find a good church where they teach the word of God and be a member of that church. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So I encourage you today, do not let Satan take advantage of what happened to you right now. I want to use this opportunity thanking all our partners all over the world. Those who are helping us through their prayers, through their services, and through their financial support. If you want to be a part of this ministry, go to our website. It is kuim.org. And there will be a donation button there, how you can participate, how you can help us even reach more people for the kingdom of God. It is only those who hear the word of God and they do it. They are the only ones who will get the benefits of the word of God. Beloved friends, I pray for you today. May the Lord be with you and bless you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you divine health and give you prosperity 
and give you a sound mind and bless your week. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Remember that is there is always that guarantee. Surely there is an end. And your expectations, the hope that you have in Christ Jesus will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.